Open Source was amazing, but I didn't get enough footage to make a video about it, so let's talk about one of the projects I had at my booth. So, I love learning languages. I'm terrible at retaining anything I've learned, mind you, or using them in any practical context, but I sure do love learning them. I recently saw that there was a Daimo tape writer style labeler that can do hiragana and katakana. I had to get one, of course. If you haven't seen one of these in person, and having had this on display at open source taught me that there is a real generation divide on the subject. So if, like me, you're old enough to remember these being a common bit of office equipment, please bear with me. They work by embossing letters onto a plastic strip. It gets squeezed between pads on this wheel, with a positive form of the character on the lower one and the negative on the top. As the plastic deforms, it turns white, providing visual contrast to the character. You select the character by turning the wheel until the pointer is pointing at the one you want. You squeeze the handle, which embosses the character and advances the tape. When you're done, there is another trigger to pull that cuts the tape. There have been dozens of variations on this over the decades, presumably because they wanted to keep patent control over the current design, but they all work more or less like this. Once you have it printed, you just pull off the strip to reveal the sticky backing and place it wherever you like. It is pleasantly analog and tactile, but rather slow to use in practice. There is a good reason they're more or less forgotten these days. The digital ones are better in every conceivable way except for maybe aesthetics and nostalgia. Anyway, I'm not great at getting around to labeling things in the shop, as my memory is just spatial enough I don't usually need it, but doing it in Katakana had some real appeal. And while it was pretty great, it mostly just opened a desire I never knew I had. I wanted more scripts in this format. I want to be able to label things in as many ways as I kind of sort of vaguely know how to read. And since Japanese seems to be the only non-Latin character set Daimo has ever supported, I knew I was going to have to do it myself. Luckily it came with English wheels as well as Kana, so I could sacrifice one to examine it in detail. Pretty simple, just two injection molded parts glued together, using these little feet things to index them. You can see the positive and negative halves of each character more clearly now. Injection molding isn't something I can do, but resin printing, that I can do. Modeling the blanks for the font wheels went easily enough. I did switch to the ABS-like resin, as I was having a lot of problems with parts chipping during use, but that was about it. The hard part was dealing with the character glyphs. I needed a way to get the characters placed in the 3D model so that the positive and negative halves would interface properly. And I needed a way to form the characters properly in the first place. See, it wasn't going to be enough to use a simple extrusion. They needed draft, expanding evenly around their perimeter at a specific angle. This would allow them to pop back out after deforming the tape instead of getting stuck. The negative forms had to be bigger than the positive to leave room for the tape itself. And that couldn't be a basic scaling operation either, because simply making everything bigger means parts won't line up properly anymore. Theoretically, this should be a well-solved problem. Die makers add draft all the time, so any good CAD package should be able to easily handle it, right? No, of course not. It was a nightmare. SolidWorks could do it, but at the angles that seem to work best, 10 to 13 degrees, it just decided not to some of the time. No obvious pattern either. It would handle something ridiculous like this just fine, and then give up when faced with something dead simple like this. Sometimes I could go in and apply the draft only to certain faces, and get something good enough to be used. Sometimes it would even work on all faces, as long as I took the step of adding them back one by one in the correct order but sometimes it just wouldn't give anything useful at all. Katia was hopeless, FreeCAD likewise. I was reduced to doing it manually by eye in Blender, and I was very close to giving up on some of these scripts. Luckily, someone suggested it should be possible in OpenSCAD, and I found this tool. It's not very well optimized, and running it takes like an hour for some pretty short strings, but it works. Not only does it work, the output meshes are far cleaner than any other technique I tried. While figuring this out, I was also iterating on a process to create the wheel models in Blender. Some of this was mechanical, how high the characters should be and how much larger the negative spaces should be to accommodate them, things like that. But a lot of it was also just working out a process that could give me reliable results. Here's what I settled on. Character meshes need to be 2 millimeters high, 
with a draft angle of 13 degrees. These can be scaled to fit the wheel pads, but only in X and Y. Leave Z at 2 millimeters. One by one, place the characters on the lower disc form. For the scripts that aren't all block capitals, a baseline has to be set up so the descenders look right. The characters are moved in Z so that only 0.7 millimeters are showing above the surface of the pads, and that's what the placement is based on. Once placed, each character is duplicated, and the new copy is moved to the right by 0.4 millimeters. Note that this motion is along the axis of the arm, not towards the center of the disc. This is to account for the arc the arm will trace as it is pushed up. Both copies are parented to the disc. The blank I designed has 40 arms, so it is rotated by 9 degrees between each character. This is repeated until all the characters have been placed. Now a copy is made, which will be used to form the negative impressions in the upper disc. The outermost copies of the characters are deleted. The remaining ones are moved in Z to mate flush against the wheel. When using the messier SOLIDWORKS output, I would check them for non-manifold vertices at this point and clean them up as best as possible. The copy of the lower wheel is then flipped over and centered above the top disc blank. The characters are joined to it, and the center is deleted so it doesn't get in the way. Snap is used again to move it down in Z so the tops of the characters are flush with the top disc. Then it is moved down again by 1.9 millimeters. This places the characters down into the surface of the disc with the wide bases just barely clearing the top. A Boolean difference operation then cuts those shapes out. The messier SOLIDWORKS version sometimes needed the self option turned on, and even then I'd usually need to go around and clean up the results manually. The bottom wheel is a lot simpler. Another copy is made, and the innermost characters are all deleted this time. The remaining characters are moved up, and a temporary cube is used to trim off the lower 1.3 millimeters of them, leaving just 0.7 behind. These are then moved back down flush to the disc and joined with it. Both of the discs are then exported to STL, opened in Chidu box, floated 5 millimeters above the plate, and tilted at 45 degrees. Prints took about 5 hours, though I was being a bit conservative in the exposure times. The two halves are cleaned and cured normally. I would smooth the bumps left from the support structures with some sandpaper, because they need to spin freely in the labeler. I'd also clean up between the pads with a nail file, since bits of supports tended to bridge the gap between them, causing them to snag on each other during use. The two halves were then glued together, using some alligator clamps to keep characters on opposite sides of the wheel interfaced properly as the glue set. If I didn't do this, sometimes the error would all land on one side and leave a dead zone of characters that didn't intermesh properly. And with that, it was time to start making the font wheels of my dreams. Font wheels that shouldn't even exist in a rational universe. Font wheels whose very existence is an affront to God. You know, the good stuff. First up, Old English. I've been obsessed with Beowulf since we read it in 8th grade. I have quite a few different versions of it. I even started to work on my own translation at one point, getting about a hundred lines done over six months. It seemed like a good script to start with because it's not that different to the English alphabet as we know it now. Some of the more modern characters like Q and Z are missing, and there are four characters that have since dropped away. Wynn, Eth, Thorn, and Ash. Wynn comes from Nordic runes and was eventually replaced with W. Ash is from the Latin alphabet and technically is still used in some special circumstances. Eth and Thorn were different ways of writing a TH th sound and can still be seen in Icelandic today. I couldn't add Arabic numerals, obviously, so I had a lot of space left over on the wheel. I added some of the more common scribal abbreviations of the time, such as Macrons over vowels that could be used instead of writing a following nasal consonant, a G with a Macron, which could be used for the common Germanic GE participle, a thorn with a slash through the top of its stem, which could stand for the word that. The little seven-looking Tyronean et, which comes from the shorthand system used by Tiro, personal secretary to the Roman statesman Cicero. This was widely used until the ampersand took over, and can still be found in Ireland and Scotland today. In Old English, it could replace both the word and, pronounced ond, as well as being used as an abbreviation for the sound ond in other words. And finally, the midline period called an interpunct, which was the only real punctuation used at the time. 
This still left some blank spots, but I really didn't want to model wheel blanks with different numbers of arms, so I left them blank. And the final result? Well, it's not perfect, but... What? Way yardena in yardeum, theod kninga throom yafrunen, who the athalingus ellen fremadon. Next up, Esperanto. <laughs> I'm not going to say Esperanto was a good idea, but it does speak to a certain utopian impulse in my soul. Plus, if you have any background in European languages, it really is very easy to learn. It uses the basic Latin alphabet, plus the rather mystifying addition of a bunch of diacritics that just make it harder to print properly for no good reason. You were so close, Samenhoff. Why couldn't you stick the landing? Plus all the weirdly gendered vocabulary when you had already eliminated grammatical gender? Why? Anyway, did you know that the U.S. military published an Esperanto guidebook in the 1960s? It's perplexingly called Esperanto the Aggressor Language. See, they were doing a bunch of big war games in which the U.S. was at war with an unspecified European nation known only as Aggressor. The enemy soldiers couldn't be speaking English, obviously, but choosing any existing language would get political really fast, so they used Esperanto. I have no idea how many soldiers actually tried to learn it just to make interrogation scenes more realistic, but it's actually a pretty good guide to the language. This copy is definitely one of my favorite cursed physical artifacts. The next one is a bit of a stretch to claim as a script, but it does encode languages. The International Phonetic Alphabet. This is a standardized way to write out basically any sound the human body can produce for use in language. Unfortunately, it's far too large to fit on a single font wheel, but by limiting myself just to the phonemes used in English, I could more or less make it work. This was the first script which wasn't all block capitals, so some of the characters have to be fairly small so they all look right when next to each other. But the results are pretty decent, I think. If you want to learn IPA, I highly recommend the Wordle-inspired Grammel. Each puzzle is a five phoneme word in English, and you're given the waveform and frequency diagram to help you figure it out. It's a lot of very frustrating fun. Let's stick with the phonemic theme for the fourth wheel, but get a lot more obscure. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw was interested in spelling reform of the English language. Part of his will set aside a good chunk of cash for the development and promotion of a new phonemic alphabet for English. The result is the Shaw alphabet, also called Shavian. I learned about this in a freshman linguistics class and found it interesting enough to take notes in it for a while. When researching for this project, I found out that a copy of Shaw's play Androcles and the Lion had been published in the 60s in a dual-text version. Happily, these are both plentiful and cheap on eBay, even ones with the original guide card. I worked my way through it, slowly, and it was fun to refresh my memory of the system. It's always a neat feeling when you start to internalize a glyph and it just starts to look like its sound. Plus, I had to relearn it just to make sure my 19-year-old self hadn't written anything too embarrassing in those notes before I included them in this video. There is, conveniently, a font with good Shavian support called Inter Alia. For reasons I still don't understand, SolidWorks absolutely hated adding draft to these characters, so this is when I started playing with OpenSCAD. I had to redo this one with the font weight changed from medium to light, since the label embossing seems to work better with thinner characters when possible, but otherwise it came out great. Unfortunately, I couldn't include the ligatures or the proper noun dot due to space restrictions. It's a fun system, but like a lot of spontaneously invented scripts, it uses a lot of rotational and or mirror symmetry in its glyphs. Please don't do this if you're ever in a position to invent a writing system. It's just not fair to those of us with a touch of dyslexia. Put in the extra effort to come up with a couple more designs. Shavin is also optimized for handwriting, being directly inspired by some shorthand systems. That's nice, but of decreasing relevance, and I think it really hurts the readability of some of the characters. And there is also the fundamental problem of phonemic writing systems. Whose phonemes are being encoded here? The instructions to the public trustee executing Shaw's will says that the play is to be translated assuming the pronunciation to resemble that recorded of His Majesty our late King George V. 
This caused me some problems reading the play. Like when the captain is described as walking away trim and calm. It wasn't until I looked at the parallel text that I realized this meant trim and calm. I guess pronouncing the L was too plebeian for his majesty. No language is ever pronounced uniformly enough for a single phonemic writing system, so spelling is always going to be weird for some people. And that problem only gets worse as the centuries pass and dialects drift. Soon you'll be back to where English spelling is now all over again. I almost forgot this one, but speaking of shorthand, let's do the old Palm Pilot Graffiti text input script. I used it extensively back in the early noughts, when I was the weirdo with the handspring phone, trying to convince everyone that smartphones were the wave of the future. My short-lived webcomic was entirely written using it. I even used to take handwritten notes on paper in it a bit, since I only ever write block capitals anyway. There is an alien elegance to it, I think, and it's definitely well suited to the wide spaces and strictly fixed with nature of the labeler. And finally, the script I didn't dare not do, Tengwar. I have to admit, despite being a lifelong linguistics and Tolkien nerd, someone whose earliest memories are of my dad reading me The Hobbit, I've never actually gotten into learning Elvish. But that said, I do have a neon Elbereth sign in the shop, since I'm also a NetHack nerd, and it seemed like a fun project when taking a neon class. So sure, here's Tengwar. This is really pushing the lower bounds of workable character size, but they had to be this small to fit on the pads. To do this properly, I think you'd have to design a custom Tengwar font that shortens the ascenders and descenders some, or at least switch to one of the larger tape writer formats. So that's been a whirlwind tour of one of my obsessions. It's not quite all the scripts I have experience with, but as much as I would love to see Devanagari or Arabic or ancient Mayan on a labeler, it's just too limited of a format to do them justice. So what font wheel would you like to make? I'm including links in the description to STL files for all of these wheels plus the blanks, so have at it. And if you stopped by at the booth at OpenSauce, it was great getting to meet you. I'm afraid I was too busy to get any footage of people using the font wheels or anything else I took, but oh well. Maybe next year.